Outer space and inner space, big and small, everything is connected. For too long, we have neglected to recognise these links of interdependence. And now, the systems that govern our world are breaking down, no longer serving any of us. There is an urgent need to reconnect to nature, to foster harmony and tear down the structures that are built on one dominating the other, human over nature, one part of humanity over another, man over woman. Structures that result in conflict, loss of democratic space and human rights, injustice, overconsumption by some, lack of resources for many, loss of biodiversity, pollution and a changing climate. Structures that endanger the web of life, our health and welfare. We need cooperation and trust instead of competition and suspicion. Well-being for nature and for all living beings instead of a focus on personal wealth and power. The good news? These systems were built by humans and we have the power to change them. This belief is what Right Livelihood is all about. This is what Right Livelihood laureates courageously work towards every day. Showing that it is possible to build a different human story, community by community. The time to act is now. Let this evening spark action in all of us. Good evening from Stockholm, Sweden. My name is Parisa Amiri, and tonight we celebrate the brave individuals and organizations whose impactful actions we so urgently need to create a new human story. Now is the time to spark action. Welcome to the Right Livelihood Award presentation. Now join me in welcoming a very nice guest. We have him here from Right Livelihood International Jury. It is Joshua Castellino, everyone. Say hello. Welcome. Joshua, you're here to help me present the awards. Indeed. You're well, very welcome for that. Thank you very and much. maybe you can tell us more about the award. Because the Right Livelihood Award, it honors people, organizations, promoting everything from art and education to food security and environmental justice. So why this great mix, some would say, and no specific categories? Well, the great mix lies in the fact that the world is a super complex place and we have super complex problems. And actually, it's human activity of different kinds that is going to be able to change that we have. And essentially, most of the la all of the laureates that we've ever honored have all have one thing in common. They are people who faced face the struggle and really use their human resources to be able to change. And that's what they have in common, and that's the strong link that we bring. And we're so thankful for that. But can you tell me about the linkage between also communities and organizations? Well, in a sense, the communities are the ones that can make the change. I think the video said it very well when it said that it's human activity that created the systems we have that are creating the, dis the disadvantage and despair that we have. And it's human systems and human beings that can change it. And communities have to be in the forefront of this. And our laureates inspire their communities. And one by one by one, each of those communities, when you put them together, can spark the kind of movement that we need to get the world that we all wish to see. We need to multiply, definitely. And the symbol for the award, if you can have a look over here, we're going to hand them out. It's a sculpture made by Swedish artist Eva Hild using a very special metal. It is called humanium. And it is made from illegal seized firearms. Very fitting, I think, for the cause. Absolutely. And it's by Swedish initiative I Am. So thank you much. Uh, thank you very much, Joshua. We'll see you in a bit to be back. Joshua Castellino. Thank you. Thank you very much. Injustice rightfully causes fear, concern, even anger. And tonight is all about challenging these feelings into courage and action.
So now let's take a moment together to breathe and enjoy this magnificent dance performance called Zirkonen, created by Michaela Fleberg. Thank you so much. It is now time to celebrate the achievements of a group of young and fearless environmental activists. They speak up against corruption and greed, and they are prepared to risk imprisonment to protect the democracy, human rights, and the environment. Now it's time to learn more about Next Right Livelihood Laureate. This is Mother Nature Cambodia. <laughs> បកបតដោយកំណត់ឆ្នៃបណ្ឌិតមានការលើកទឹកចិត្តនឹងផ្ដល់ជាគម្រូភាពនៅក្នុងការការពារបរិស្ថាននឹងធនធានធម្មជាតិនៅក្នុងប្រទេសកម្ពុជាលៀតតាដាំអំពើពករលួយពាក់ព័ន្ធនឹងការបំផ្លិចបំផ្លាញធនធានធម្មជាតិក្រ
Please welcome to the stage representatives of the movement Mother Nature Cambodia. Applause for Rata, Lisa, and Chantalabut. Stage is yours, Rata. First of all, we want to thank Riley Hood for this award. Being recognized like this in such a way is very valuable, not just to our organization, but to all Cambodians. People in my beloved country will see once again how participating in the protection of the environment is not an illegal act. I use the word illegal because that is what the government of Cambodia is fond of calling us an illegal group. As the matter of fact, me and my companion here, Dara Vod, were jailed under awful condition for five months since 2021. We still face up to another 10 years in jail if found guilty during an upcoming so-called trial. Since 2015, 11 members of Mother Nature Cambodia has been in jail, all on order from the government. All of us, needless to say, charged in jail on make-up crimes. Despite Cambodia officially being the being a democracy, and despite billions with a B of dollars spent by the interna international community to bring about democracy since the early 90s, the situation in the countries continues to be dire. Our forests, rivers, lakes, our land, our water continue to be destroyed or sold or needless teeth, or all this combined. Be protected forests will get privatized while scale, logging, and mineral extraction continue to happen without even the facade of transparency. Cambodia, not long ago, was home to some of the world's most healthy forests, teeming with ancient trees and incredible wildlife. Then, with development as the issues, these forests were cut down and continue to be, without much consideration. A tiny elite has become incredibly rich because of this, while Cambodia continues to be one of the poorest countries in Asia, with an average monthly income of 130 US dollars. Yes, being the risk of being the risk of yes, the risk of being an effective frontline activist like me are real. We can't deny that. But another much more positive reality is that the new generation of Cambodians is growing up. This is the generation that did not live through the awful genocide and civil wars of the 70 and 80, a generation that dreams of a Cambodia that respects the environment, that takes pride in its forests and rivers. A Cambodia where the words democracy, development, and the rule of law are not empty words used as excuses to express critics or to engage in gross corruption, but words with the real meaning. A message to the government of Cambodia for this new generation of Cambodians that I and my colleagues are a part of being sent to the present for fighting for the common goods and protecting our natural resources is nothing we are ashamed of. 
It is not going to discourage us from fulfilling our dreams. To, and to wrap up, our final message to the young people of Cambodia, being a Cambodia building, a Cambodia that is truly free and democratic, where nature is protected and respected is not only possible, but it's our duty. Now, a short message from our friends who could not make it to Stockholm. Environmentalists from Cambodia has been persecuted without respect. Now is the time to stand up for the environment. Now is the time to stand up for Cambodia. We would have loved to have built such a strong movement of a generation. But what is your main focus going forward? We have our main focus on uh, our campaign, Saving Gokong Island. And we also have other activities, such as um, producing videos, cartoons, artistic pictures to, uh, to expose environmental crimes in all forms. Furthermore, we empower young people to be active citizens. You have very impressive creative tactics, as you may know. But my question is, as many may feel in this room, what can the people in this room or watching do to support you and your cause? Environmentalists all around the world are being oppressed by, uh, for their activism. So it is our duty to make the oppressor hear that we deserve better environment. And first thing we can do today, please give a round of applause for all environmental defenders in the world. Thank you. Definitely. From the bottom of our hearts, we thank you for what you do, not just for your own local communities, but for all communities. This matters for all and everyone. Thank you, Mother Nature, Cambodia. Right, Life with Laureate. Yeah. 2023, thank you so much. Over the years, all too many Right Livelihood Laureates have been imprisoned for their human rights work. Among them are three brave human rights defenders from Saudi Arabia, awarded in 2018, while all of them imprisoned for dem democratic reform, promotion of that in their home country. Walid Abu Al Khair, internationally praised human rights lawyer, sentenced to 15 years in prison and who still has five years of detention remaining. Abdallah Al-Hamid, poet and professor, died while serving an 11-year sentence as a result of medical neglect by Saudi authorities. The third Saudi laureate is Mohammad Fad Al-Qatani. He co-founded an organization together with Abdallah Al-Hamid to advance democratic reforms and monitor human rights violations. Al Qatani was sentenced on trumped up charges. After serving 10 years in prison, he was supposed to be released in November of last year, but he was forcibly disappeared shortly before his release date. Since then, his family has been prevented from being in contact with him or knowing his exact whereabouts. More than a year has passed and they still don't know where he is. Al Katani once said, you cannot stop rights activists. They are like weeds. When you pull out a few, more grow back stronger and thicker. Alongside 10 human rights organizations, Riot Livelihood is calling on Saudi Arabia to immediately disclose where he is and to release him. And we hope that all of you are willing to be a part of the efforts to free Al Qatani. There will be more on that later on. But now we are honored to have Mohammed's son with us here in Stockholm, Sweden. He has traveled here to enlighten us about his father's work and their situation. The warmest welcome to Abdallah Al Qatani.
Good evening, everybody. Hello? Good evening, everyone. I hope everybody's doing okay. Back in 2009, I remember I was 13 years old and I lived with my family in Saudi Arabia. Every Monday evening, my father, uh, he went to see his friends and they talked politics. Because I was the oldest, my dad would always take me with him uh, to listen, serve coffee. Uh, we always, they always left their cell phones in the car. Uh, they never told me why, but as I grew up, I understood uh, that it was to avoid surveillance. About 30 men would gather, and the conversations went on for hours on hours. Sometimes they brought a camera to record their discussions. Like most kids my age, I was totally bored. So when I could, I would just try to sneak out and play video games as much as I can um, when, when they were busy with their conversations. My dad was never happy about this. He always got upset because he wanted me to sit there and listen to him. Uh, but now, sometimes I actually go on YouTube uh, and I would listen to his videos uh, and his friends that they published back then. Now I realize I was serving coffee to some of the most progressive champions of democracy and human rights activists in Saudi Arabia that has ever seen. Uh, and one of them is my father. Dear father, earlier this week I visited London and I met with activists and government officials. Everywhere I went, people talked so highly of you. Uh, they always ask me, are you the son of Muhammad al Qatani?" Uh, and uh, they would smile and ask, and I felt so proud. We're all proud of you and what you have accomplished. My father is one of the founders of a human rights organization called uh, ACPRA. Uh, they wanted to give more power to the people and to end male uh, guardianship. My dad and many others uh, were thrown in jail for their peaceful efforts to reform Saudi Arabia. My father was sentenced to 10 years in prison um, on charges like disobeying the ruler. Um, my dad laughed at the judge who handed the, down the sentences, actually. Uh, shortly before the ruling, uh, we were uh, exiled to the US. My father knew that it was coming and made sure we left the country safely. Uh, my sister Layla, actually, uh, at the time, she was only a few months old uh, at the time. Despite being in prison, uh, my dad actually called twice a day, and he was very engaged in our daily lives. Um, however, in October last year, he stopped calling. Uh, that was only uh, one month before his release date. Uh, we have not been in touch with him ever since. In the beginning, my sister Lila asked, why does Baba not call anymore? Uh, I didn't know what to say. I was just stunned. Um, the silence caused by my father, by my father's forced disappearance, has deeply wounded us as a family. Every day, my mother, would call pri my, mo mother, my mother would call the prison and pretty much anyone to ask about my father. She was told by a Saudi official to forget that man and move on, which we will never do. Uh, Abdullah Al Hamid, who received the Right Livelihood Award with my dad, passed away in prison due to medical neglect by authorities. I don't want my father to face the same fate. He should have never been jailed for promoting democracy. No one should. He must be released now. I hope you, I hope you will join our calls to free my father and all other political prisoners in Saudi. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you for that deeply touching testimony from Abdallah al Katani about his father. And dear audience, to make sure that we are doing all we can to support um, the efforts, Right Livelihood now asks you to join in on calling on Saudi authorities to immediately disclose Muhammad's location, to release him unconditionally, and to let him contact his family. Now on the screen, or in your program, you should see a QR code, and if you scan that code with your phone, everyone in the audience also has it, you are able to sign the petition to free al Qatani. So please also, to really light up the venue in support of al Qatani, switch on your flashlight when you've signed the petition so we can really show that we are many in this fight to free him. Thank you. I can see the 
Thank you. That was If I Had Superpowers by Zavala Al Khalidi, Sisoko Amper. Thank you for the music and, of course, also the powerful support showing. And please sign the petition and share your support under the hashtag Free Al Qatani. Every year, the World Health Organization estimates that 25 million unsafe abortions occur worldwide. Without access to proper contraceptives and safe abortion services, there are deadly risks for affected women and girls. Dr. Eunice Brookman Amissa from Ghana 
has secured these rights partly and dedicated her life to this. Now joining us soon, but to get to this point, she needed to change her mindset first. Let's learn her story. At the time that we started, the word abortion was taboo and was not really a word that you could talk about in, in public. Out of the total of about 36,000 maternal deaths from unsafe abortion, almost 24,000 were from Africa alone. And that was about 60% of the total. That was a totally unacceptable uh, state of affairs, considering that nobody, absolutely no woman has to die from a totally treatable and manageable cause of unsafe abortion. Working from the highest levels of the continent, at the AU level, and the levels of the AU agencies, regional and sub-regional agencies, were able to get the continent at the highest level to take measures to curb this sad and unfortunate issue of preventable deaths of women from unsafe abortion. So for me, Ghana led the way. Currently, as we speak, led by the leadership of Dr. Yunus Brooke and Emisan, Kenya also started it, Zambia started it, Mozambique, you know, countries around um, have started it. The work has been very beneficial. For the 14 and a half years that we existed in Ghana and worked um, closely with the leadership from Dr. Yunus Brookman, um, I believe that Ghanaian women have benefited a lot. We also often say that the womb belongs to the woman. The womb doesn't belong to a man. The womb doesn't belong to any other person. The woman had a right to determine what should happen to her body. And also the fact that we have been able to get more countries to provide preventable measures, such as um, family planning, or what I would rather call contraception, to prevent unwanted pregnancies. I think that due to the work that I did with the team of experts that I worked with, women now have access to safe abortion in many of our countries. And the deaths from this scourge, as I call it, have been greatly reduced, but there's still a lot more to be done. Please welcome to the stage 2023 Right Live with Laureates, Dr. Eunice Brookman, Amissa. Dr. Brookman and Mr. thank you for being here with us tonight. What does this award mean to you and receiving this now? Well, I'm speechless now. I deem it a great honor for the work that I did with others to improve access to safe abortion for women, recognized in this way by the Right Livelihood Foundation. I hope, indeed, believe that this recognition and public recognition of unsafe abortion will lead the world to come together to do something about a totally preventable cause of the death of women. Definitely. We all have to do what we can. 
with the global backlash on women's rights, definitely we all have to fight for women's rights. Now we're looking forward to hear your ver words this evening. Your the stage is yours, thank you. Hello everybody. I must say I greatly appreciate Right Livelihood's resolve to bring the usually unrecognized and taboo subject of unsafe abortions out on the world stage with this award. It is about time that we, the issue of the death of tens of thousands of women from a totally preventable cause is brought out of the closet and recognized in this very public way. When over two decades ago, I was invited to join IPAS, the international NGO working globally to bring reproductive justice for women and to reduce preventable maternal deaths from unsafe abortions, I opted for a two-year contract. I moved from Ghana to set up an office in Nairobi, Kenya. 22 years later, a great deal has been achieved by the small team of dedicated professional men and women from across the continent and the US who worked together with me on the issue of reducing deaths from unsafe abortion in Africa. I recognize all their efforts uh, to expand access to quality safe abortion care and I raise this award to them also. The strategy to work at the regional level with the African Union and its agencies, with elected politicians, the women's movement, and a wide range of strategically selected groups as partners, as well as individual regional champions, worked very well. We achieved great successes in the adoption of regional-wide policies and agreements that could then percolate to the country level and give a boost to country level advocacy. The requirements for making deaths from unsafe abortions a thing of the past are all well known. What is needed is for further country level action to talk the talk and walk the walk. Our work is not done yet. We have heard the statistics about 30,000 women dying annually from a totally preventable cause is not acceptable, it can never be acceptable. That is the equivalent of a hundred jumbo jet planes full of women crashing down from the skies and killing every one of them every year. It is not acceptable, especially when we know how to prevent the carnage. Ladies and gentlemen, we have the evidence that safe abortions save lives, and also that access to contraception prevents unwanted pregnancies and is cost-effective. They both lead to improvements in the lives of girls and women and the elimination of preventable maternal deaths. I would like to end with a quote, quote by Professor Mahmoud Fatala, considered the greatest women's rights champion of the last century, who we sadly lost recently. He said, and I quote, that women are not dying of diseases we cannot treat. They are dying because societies have yet to make the decision that their lives are worth saving. I call on all well-meaning people, wherever they are in this world, to act to eliminate this pandemic of deaths and disabilities from unsafe abortions. I thank you very much for your attention.
Living in Kenya, our next Right Livelihood Laureate, she started her activism after being poisoned by the factory she worked at, a battery smelting plant which also poisoned her son and thousands of other community members, some even dying. She has been dubbed the Erin Brockovich of East Africa. Phyllis Omido is a land and environmental defender, affirming the people's right to a clean and healthy environment and the state's responsibility to safeguard it. My name is Phyllis Omido, the executive director at Center for Justice, Governance and Environmental Action. I'm also a land and environment defender. I work with communities that reside around extractive industries and communities that are affected by big government infrastructure projects. My work started in a community called Uwinohu. It's an urban poor community. When I took children to be tested for lead poisoning, all 10 tested positive for lead poisoning. My son had also been, um, had also tested positive for lead poisoning. And therefore, whatever he was going through, the community children were also going through. The day that finally this melter started shutting down, for me it was like a dream because since 2009 to 2014, I had been pushing for Kenya to shut down these melters because toxic waste was being brought from everywhere to Kenya, where it was cleaned up and then 99% uh, pure lead was being exported outside Kenya to countries that did not allow such dirty work to impact their environment and their people. I found this to be so unfair because we were not, as a country, benefiting in any way. Phyllis has done a lot of good work in the community of Oinoru because through the help of Phyllis, we come to conclude that the smelter factory was harming the people. So Phyllis has helped us. If it was not Phyllis, I don't know what could have happened. Right now in Unohuro, we need at least a billion Kenya shillings to be able to actually restore the environment to what it was before. 50% of the people that worked in metal refinery have died. We have seen a lot of loss of life in Oinohuru, sadly. This also has united us a lot. It brings me so much joy to see how the communities evolve to a point where they do not need me to articulate their rights. They can stand up for themselves, they can go to these government offices and properly articulate what their rights are within the Kenyan constitution. You do not need anything to become a land and environment defender. All you need to do is love yourself, love nature, and understand that both you and your future generations need to live. Please welcome to the stage 2023 Right Live Laureate, Phyllis Amido, everyone. The one and only. The stage is yours. One day in 2012, after I was arrested for assembling the Unohuru community to protest against pollution in their community, my four-year-old son asked me, Mama, are you a bad person? I answered, no, son. It was my concern for his health that had led me down this path. This is over a decade ago. He was hospitalized, hospitalized as a baby, and it turned out that my exposure to, to heavy, metal, heavy toxic metals at my job was poisoning him. I'm deeply grateful that he's here today.
I hope he now knows that it's never a bad thing to fight for what is right. When a state license smelter opened its doors in Onohuru settlement with over 3,000 residents, the community began falling sick with respiratory illnesses, the children's skin would peel off because of the acid rain that was falling on their playground. Pregnant women miscarried and many faced impotency problems. Many people still suffer today from kidney failure and countless have died. This is what happens when we compromise on the right to a clean and healthy environment. In 2014, we shut down 17 smelters that had been operating in Kenya once lead was banned, once lead export was banned. However, our victory is not complete. Our legal team uh, from my organization, Center for Justice, Governance and Environmental Action, and the lead poisoning victims have been fighting in court since 2016. In 2020, we received a landmark ruling that our fundamental rights had been violated. The victims were also awarded monetary compensation and environmental cleanup. However, the judgment has been viciously attacked within and outside the corridors of power in Kenya. Ironically, those entrusted with protecting Kenyans' rights are the ones fighting to stop us. We are currently at the Supreme Court of Kenya, hoping for a ruling that recognizes the importance of environmental justice and that finds even the most vulnerable deserving of justice. Being an environmental activist is a lifetime commitment that requires resilience and a strong support system. In times of adversity, we lean on those who share the same struggle with us. This is why it's so important to be part of the Right Livelihood Laureate family. In 2012, not only was I arrested, but I was faced by a brutal attack by armed men outside my house because of my activism. This is the reality of thousands of land and environment defenders globally. My dear friend, Bata Caceres, is among those that have been killed for their work. We live at a time when profits outweigh reason, when opposing profits for the sake of our children's future is criminalized, when governments and corporations align against defenseless defenders. Many countries have not affirmed the right to a clean and healthy environment in their constitutions. I can't imagine how much harder it would have been for, Ken for us in Kenya if Kenya did not recognize the right to a clean and healthy environment. The UN has now finally recognized the right to a clean and healthy environment, and hopefully every government on earth follows suit. Yet it doesn't end. <laughs> Yet it doesn't end at recognizing the right to a clean and healthy environment but actualizing it for all, for all uh, people of the planet, and especially the most vulnerable. This award recognizes all defenders of our planet globally. It is a call to action for their resourcing and protection at this time of planetary distress. I dedicate this award to the Oyombo community in Kenya that is fighting to protect their lives and their environment from the government's plans for a nuclear reactor in their home. My sincere gratitude to the members of the IROG network and the Kana network in Kenya, my dear sisters in the struggle, Ika Langele and Rachel Mwakali, this is for you, Asante Nisan. People over profit, thank you so much. Phyllis Omido, thank you. Right Livelihood has its main office here. You're, com you're coming back. I'm so happy about that. Thank Sorry. you. <laughs> Phyllis, I yes. interviewed you the other day, yeah. and you expressed that it took some time for you to really accept the claim that you're an environment environmental activist. Why was that? When I began my work, I did not identify as an environmental activist because I was just a mother and a concerned citizen trying to inform 
the duty bearers that something was critically wrong and it needed to be corrected. It is until when I was arrested, um, forced to sleep in the jail, and then arraigned in court, charged with inciting violence and illegal gathering. And when the Winohuru community followed me, slept outside the courts, slept outside the police cell, walked uh, almost an hour to get to court to be there to support me. That is when I accepted my role as a land and environment defender. And we are so thankful to you for being that and doing that greatly. Immense change for everyone in regards to this. I also want to ask you if we have time. Having done all these things, accomplished these changes, what is your current focus going forward? Um, my focus is on mentoring the younger generation. Um, I continue my work in Kenya, working with communities, ensuring that their right to a clean and healthy environment is upheld and protected. But I feel that um, this struggle really is for future generations, and therefore future my role... Future generations coming up on stage, <laughs> I love that. <laughs> and therefore my role is now to mentor the future generations. Thank you for your dedication and work for your community and all communities. Phyllis Omido, 2023 Right Livelihood Laureate. Right Livelihood has its main office here in Stockholm, Sweden, with a second office in Geneva, home to one of the major offices of the United Nations. The next dance performance manifests how we need to lean on each other to build a better future. People to rely on and help move things forward. Once again, we can enjoy part of the powerful dance performance, Sirkoanan, with music by Vas.
On the shores of North Africa, large groups of migrants risk their lives boarding unsafe boats. Escaping conflict, poverty, and authoritarian regimes, they seek their way to Europe. The British Somali poet War Shire once said, no one leaves home unless home is the mouth of a shark. But too often, these people end up in the water and are denied assistance from European authorities. This shocking lack of humanity and solidarity led some European citizens to set up a rescue organization. This is our next Right Livelihood Laureate, SOS Mediterrane. SOS Mediterrane is a maritime and humanitarian European organization. What we do is quite basic. We go at sea in the international waters and we, we rescue people and we bring them to safety. We have uh, associations in Germany, France, Italy and Switzerland and we're all pulling resources to charter the Ocean Viking, which is a ship that is doing uh, search and rescue operations in the central Mediterranean Sea. So far, we have brought to safety 39,000 people, 39,000 stories, uh, parents, sisters, kids, every single rescue is a, an amazing moment. Since we are a very small organization, we are very much aware of every single operational step. The stories, the nationalities, the, the ages of the people, whatever the numbers, it's something completely exceptional. We've been able to rescue human lives and it's amazing in itself. The situation in the central Mediterranean Sea is still going on. There are still a lot of people fleeing Libya and Tunisia now and that they are risking their lives to do so. Our main wish is that we are able to shut down the organization at some point, that we are not needed anymore because the European Union has put in place an official search and rescue operation. If it's not the case, then the other choices would be that we are able to rescue as many people as possible. But honestly, we really would like to not have to be there and do that. People shouldn't have to risk their lives to be able to uh, reach uh, safety. It's, it just it doesn't make sense. Please welcome to the stage. Director General for the 2023 Right Livelihood Laureate. We have with us Caroline Abusada. Thank you. Oh, 39,000 people, Caroline. Do you understand? <laughs> <laughs> because of you. Can but you take us with you to the Ocean Viking from this room and tell us what is it like to be on the boat and suddenly finding distressed people in the water? So just to start with, it's 39,165 now. <laughs> so it's... Uh, voilà. and, um, A rescue is always a bit, um, as I mentioned earlier, it's a, it's a phenomenal moment. It's, uh, there's cries, there's uh, tears, there's, um, so since I'm crying as well, it's, uh, we are sharing moments of emotions. It's, uh, it's extremely strong. Uh, it's very difficult moments as well, and that's why we have a very professional rescue team on board to make sure that Everyone is safe on board, uh, and as I mentioned in the video, we shouldn't be there to do that. I mean, we shouldn't have to do that. And I know you have a rescue team and a post-rescue team. Can you tell us a bit about the teams and how they yeah, work? Th there are three teams on the ship. So the Ocean Viking is a 69 meters long uh, vessel. And there's the team of the, of the ship owner, so to run the ship. There's the team of SOS Mediterranean, 
who are professional rescuers, and they are male and female. Uh, and we also have the team of the International Federation of the Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies, and they are providing medical and uh, protection activities on board the ship. Um, and you are what is called a maritime humanitarian organization. Can you tell us a bit about the legal framework guiding your operations? Yeah, it's extremely important for us to state that we are a maritime and humanitarian organization because uh, rescuing people uh, in distress at sea is a legal obligation. Whichever vessel, whichever asset is present at sea and is witnessing uh, an embarkation in distress has to rescue them. So for us, it's extremely important. It's a matter of law. The number of people risking their lives on the Mediterranean Sea peaked in 2023. And only two weeks ago, Italian authorities detained your ship. Do you want to tell, tell us what's going on, what's happening? Yes. So we are in detention for 20 days because we've done a rescue. Uh, that while the um, Italian maritime authorities ask us to proceed to a place of safety. And since the embarkation that we saw was really in distress and really needed our help, we decided to uh, pursue the rescue. And when we arrived in the place of safety, we were detained. So this detention is going to last until the beginning of December, which means we are not able to be at sea at the moment and to be able to rescue people, which is a very difficult moment for us. And you rescued 34 people that day? Yeah, yes. 128 in total. And I've understood that you receive a lot of threats and a lot of hate because of your work saving lives through legality, as you say, but what keeps you and your team going? Because there's no choice. I mean, there's no choice. As long as there are people, there are people <laughs> risking their lives, we need to be there. It's, um... what, in your mind, what in your mind has to happen next? Uh, I mean, there should be a European search and rescue operation being put in place. Uh, that's clearly something that should happen very quickly. And as long as this is not happening, we should actually have uh, the capacity to be able to rescue people without obstacles. There should be far more assets than there are at the moment to be able to rescue people. So it's a, it's a matter of... Uh, willingness as well, and it's a matter of letting us do the job while uh, the European states are actually putting one mechanism in place. And I know maybe you wanted to thank your, your colleagues? Yes, I mean, it's a, so we are a re European network. It's a, we have organizations in Germany, France, uh, Italy, and Switzerland. We have the team on board the ship. Uh, we have citizens supporting us. It's extremely important, this mobilization that is helping us to keep going. You ask before why we keep going. It's also because of the people uh, surrounding us. And so I'd like to also dedicate that uh, award to all of them, to all the people we've rescued. And if I may say one last thing, so as a member of uh, SOS Mediterranean Network and as a Palestinian as well, I'd like to uh, call for really pay attention to dehumanization uh, speeches because this is bringing 30,000 lives lost at sea 15,000 lives lost in Gaza, and it's really, really an issue. Thank you so much, SOS Mediterranean, Caroline Abusada, General Thank Director. You. Thank you for coming here tonight and re receiving your award. One of the previous Right Livelihood laureates, Gino Strada from Italy, he campaigned throughout his whole life for a future where all wars would be banned. He once said that, if any human being is suffering at this moment, if they are ill or they are hungry, it must concern us all. Because ignoring a person's suffering is always an act of violence and one of the most cowardly.
Before we end this very moving and meaningful evening, I would like to have a few words with the, with the executive director of Right Livelihood. He's very eager. Ole from X School, welcome. Welcome. Thank you. thank you. And thank you for everything you're doing, putting an evening like this together, Ole. Thank you. Following global news, Ole, we're all probably wondering, how do you stay motivated, even though there is so much hardship and conflict? It's not difficult for us with such amazing laureates. Um, I, I like this saying that a falling tree makes more noise than a growing forest. And I, of course, there are the crises in the world, the terrible catastrophes. But what we see in our work a lot is a lot of you know, what's growing up, the alternatives, which maybe take time to grow, but they are many and they are powerful in the end. And that's important. I love that saying. I will take that with me, actually. But now uh, the news are especially filled with horrific violence and suffering due to the situation in Israel and Palestine. Can you talk about how Right Livelihood laureates are responding to this unfolding horror in the region? That is such a situation um, where we have a number of laureates in the region. Six uh, Right Livelihood Awards have gone to Israel and Palestine since the beginning, and they've been building peace for decades from the grassroots. I'm thinking of Physicians for Human Rights, for instance, an Israeli organization of doctors that is working for human rights that has now been supporting the communities that were victims of the terror attacks, that has been in solidarity with the health workers in the Gaza Strip and they came under bombardment, has been calling for an end to the bombardment. I'm thinking of Raji Sorani in the Gaza Strip, a Palestinian human rights laureate who were tar was targeted himself, was bombed several times and of course we see this conflict through their eyes also and we mourn together with them. But Ulle, you've seen a lot of different processes going on. What do you think is needed at this moment? Well, I think what really is needed is everyone's respect for international law. We talked about that in the film. International law has been violated by both sides. There have been war crimes on both sides, and it's so important to bring accountability. And that's something that Raji Sarani, for instance, has been demanding, because without accountability, the same crimes will happen over and over again. And also, I think going forward, respect for international law, there are countless UN resolutions also on the situation in the Middle East. It's very important for the international community to stand up for that rather than for states to say, I stand unconditionally on this side or that side. No, the international community needs to stand unconditionally on the side of international law, period. And Ulle, Right Livelihood celebrates and supports brave change makers work going on every single day. How do you find out about them? Um, well, I was on the, on the Swedish uh, morning show this morning and they asked me, what is it like at your award presentation? Is it different from the Nobel banquet? And I said, yeah, it's, it's a bit of a different style. Um, but I also said it's different because everyone can come. And that is also how we work with nominations. Everybody in the world can send us nominations for the award, and we're opening the nominations for the 2024 awards tonight. So from today onwards, you can go to the Right Livelihood website, rightlivelihood.org slash nominate, and you can send us nominations for next year. Mm, I look forward to seeing who made it, but I want to know, you do such an impressive, different varieties of work, but how do you finance your team, and how many are you? We're some 20 people. We showed before that we're working in Stockholm and in Geneva. We work on the nominations, but we do a lot of work with this amazing network of laureates. And um, the trick with the financing is kind of the same. Everyone can contribute. So it's really from private individuals that um, our work is financed. And you find uh, a QR code or an account number even in uh, the leaflets on your seats. So everybody is welcome to support that. Yes, there are programs near to your seat. Thank you. But Ole, a night like this, there are so many different things to absorb, take in. What do you suggest we do with all these emotions and experiences? Well, for me, I mean, t tonight is also, we had a whole program here with the lawyers, so tonight is the last night for us. And I think, for me, what stays from this week is a quote by, by you, Phyllis. Uh, when you said in one of the interviews, you got this question of, you know, how do we build change? How do we move complex, this complex, uh, messy system that societies are to a better future? And you said, it's easy. You just start 
others will follow along. Mm. I think that is what we should take with us. Memorable and true. Thank you so much. And thank you for everything you do, Olle von Ixholt. Thank you for tonight. Thank you. And we will now end this evening with music and lyrics written by Nadine Al-Khalidi as a tribute to her father. The song is called Hua and performed by Zavala Al-Khalidi Sisoko Amper once more. But I want to quote a bit of the song. Shake the earth with your voice like an earthquake, he said. Be strong, satisfied, dream and dare. And I hope this evening will result in you watching, dreaming and daring to act, because we need every single one of you for the new human story. Thank you and good night. I'm a dream.